Giant mammoths are roaming the plains of the Americas, ferocious carnivores with imposing saber teeth, lemurs as big as apes and wombats as big as cars. Only a few thousand years ago, the earth was once teeming with gigantic beasts like this. Megafauna ranging from several hundred to several thousand pounds were once found in great variety on nearly every continent. All of a sudden, they seem to vanish, however. So the question is, what happened to them? They died. Though I suspect that answer might not be enough for a lot of you. The Pleistocene Megafaunal Collapse, commonly abbreviated as the PMC, was an event in Earth's history taking place from the end of the Pleistocene into the Holocene, starting around 50,000 years ago. The extinction didn't hit all parts of the Earth equally, however. Some continents got a mere trimming of their megafauna, whereas others got hit by a battering ram. Africa and South Asia had their fair share of extinctions, for example, though they were far less affected, still retaining enormous megafauna such as elephants, rhinos, hippos, and giraffes. Then we have places like North America, where over 70% of their megafaunal species died by the end of the Pleistocene. And then still you have areas like New Zealand and Madagascar, island regions whose local megafaunal populations got obliterated during the late Pleistocene into the early Holocene. So to ask the question again, what exactly caused all this? I'm going to start off by discussing the overkill hypothesis, the more fun reason behind the extinctions. I say fun not because any of this makes me happy, but more so because this hypothesis lets us point our fingers at a group of people and dump the entire blame of the megafaunal deaths on them. There are quite a few people who'll take offense at the idea. Some argue that to attribute the extinctions primarily to humans would be heavily discounting the role of the environmental and climatic changes that played into the downfall of so many species. And for a more personal reason, some people don't like having fingers wagged at them, calling them bad for being responsible for killing off a bunch of cool animals. I personally think those people are stupid, and I say this because, honestly, why are you offended at what I'm accusing your super great 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 grandparents of doing, bro? Like, what do you do, man? In my opinion, these people need to touch grass. All that said, there's more merit to the overkill hypothesis than at first glance. Paleontologist Paul S. Martin brings up an interesting pattern that occurred during the late Pleistocene when it came to human migrations. Essentially, a group of people would travel to a new area of the planet filled with megafauna. Shortly thereafter, those large animals would go extinct. The large prey animals would be overhunted. In turn, their large predators, everything from saber-toothed cats to short-faced bears to American lions and so on, would eventually run out of food sources. But hold on a second. This theory seems pretty solid on paper, if it wasn't for the fact that humans at the time could hardly be described as quote-unquote killing machines. Hunter-gatherer groups are loosely organized, but they could rarely make kills on larger megafauna through their conventional tactics. Then of course there's the other aspect of the hunter-gatherer, the gatherer. In truth, a lot of these times humans would have opted to gather items such as berries or other types of fruit for food. In the cases they did eat meat, it'd usually be in the form of slow-moving prey such as shellfish or smaller mammals. How then could one justify the idea of a human catalyst for these extinctions? To address the issue, Martin had another idea, one that revolved around the dynamics of predator and prey. See, while a predator, say a lion, would be well aware of the movements and escape options of its prey like a zebra, so too would the zebra be well aware of the attack patterns of the lion. These understandings between the two species formed over the course of them occupying the same environment for a very long time. But when a brand new pattern with a very unique pattern of attack enters a new environment, the prey will be far more susceptible to getting hunted down. This, Martin argues, was the case of the most deadly predator in the planet's history, humanity. Unlike anything the megafauna had witnessed before, they'd naively react to the oncoming threat. For many of them, by the time they were actually able to react, it'd be too late. And it was the larger animals, with them being a larger source of food for humans, that would have been hit the hardest. And with the longer reproductive cycles of animals such as mammoths and mastodons, the adaptational window just wasn't wide enough. This event was something Martin dubbed as Blitzkrieg, a very on-the-nose term to describe the overkill of megafauna in places such as the Americas. Humans essentially farmed Eurasian, American, and Australian megafauna. From the outset, it actually helps why extinctions in the Americas and Australia were so disproportionately tragic. Those continents saw isolation from Eurasia and Africa for millions of years, and so obviously those animals would have no clue about humans when they arrived. Comparatively, Africa and South Asia, two places that humans were around for for a long, long time, would be filled with animals who knew full well of man's danger. And for what it's worth, there are places around the world that support the overkill hypothesis. New Zealand, for example, was settled relatively recently by humans, and soon after this settling, we see the extinction of several large animals such as the giant moa birds. 
Madagascar is another such example of an island that saw a decline in species following human arrival, with animals such as the elephant birds, giant sloth lemur, and the Madagascar hippos going extinct. That's right, there used to be hippos in Madagascar. But Martin was met again with some more arguments against his theory. Why would hunters be so indiscriminate in their killing? Wouldn't it make more sense to target a few reliable sources for food? Martin had an answer for that too. Thanks to how easily humans could now obtain food, their population saw great increases, which in turn led to larger numbers of people spreading across the new world. Within a span of a few thousand years, Martin argued, humans would have migrated all the way to the end of South America, a death knell for the megafauna of the Americas. Hearing all this really gets your blood boiling, doesn't it? Well, it sure does for me. I mean, we could have gotten mammoths, mastodons, camels, giant armadillos, giant sloths, saber-toothed cats, horses, and all kinds of sick animals all over America. And now what? I mean, I'm pretty sure I saw a bobcat driving home the other day, but come on, man. But see, that's what I love about the overkill hypothesis. It lets me take all of this pent-up anger out on a bunch of dead old guys. I really ought to end the video right here. I'm so mad. But you know what? I'm going to hear some other reasons out. This time, let's look at the environmental factors that might have played a hand. One reason has to do with the changing seasonal patterns at the end of the Pleistocene. Much of the late Pleistocene was characterized by low seasonality. Then suddenly as we approach the Holocene, these areas all of a sudden go through a far more seasonal change, and it's argued that many of the larger animals just couldn't adapt. But if you're still holding on to hope on pinning the blame solely on our ancestors, don't worry, because what this theory fails to take into account are areas such as Australia, whose megafaunal extinctions took place 45,000 to 40,000 years ago. This is far earlier than the Holocene, so at least for Australia, this idea of ecological-based extinction doesn't hold as much water. But let's talk about areas like North America, which proponents of this theory would usually cite as reference regions. Many of the animals alive there during the Pleistocene, from mammoths to camels to ground sloths to horses, were found in all sorts of different environments. Mammoths, for example, can live in both frigid Arctic regions down to far more temperate grasslands. And in our modern day, we can see camels and horses occupy several different environments as well. Camels can be found both in deserts and in far snowier regions, and we see horses in the steppes of Asia as well as the American plains, though that's through introduced species. That being said, those species are still very closely related to the ones in America, so it should be safe to assume that those American species can have a similar level of adaptability. But before you're ready to settle with the Blitzkrieg hypothesis, let's address a few more problem areas. Now the first off is Eurasia, a part of the world we really haven't talked much about up to now. Much like the Americas, the final composition of Europe and Northern Asia was near unrecognizable to what it was today. Everything from mammoths, rhinos, hyenas, lions, cave bears, and so on roamed the areas of these two continents. And by the Holocene, much of this megafauna is wiped out. There are two problems here when it comes to trying to reconcile these extinctions with Martin's theories. Number one, these extinctions weren't concentrated near the end of the Pleistocene, as was the case with the American extinctions. Instead, we see many species as dates of extinctions are more spread apart. The giant rhinoceros Elasmotherium went extinct around 39,000 years ago. The cave bear and giant elephant Paleoloxodon nematicus went extinct around 24,000 years ago. And the iconic woolly mammoth managed to hang on to mainland Eurasia until a little later than 10,000 years ago. Of course, in the grand scheme of the Pleistocene, these extinctions seem relatively close. But then again, let's compare that to the American extinctions. Jefferson's ground sloth went extinct about 13,000 years ago, as did the American camel camelops. The Colombian mammoth died out around 12,800 years ago, and the South American Cuvieris gompathir, a close relative of the elephant, went extinct about 12,000 years ago. As you can see, these extinctions are not only far less spaced apart, but far more concentrated near the Holocene transition. Now in truth, there are a few exceptions of animals that hung around far later or died far earlier than these geologic epochs. But that's just it. Those are exceptions to what seems to be a pretty solid rule. Now the issue of extinction spacing leads me to problem number two. The thing is, humans have been on mainland Eurasia for several tens of thousands of years. So why is it that the pattern of extinction there didn't mirror that in North and South America? Either these animals would have successfully adapted to human pressures as did the African and South Asian fauna leading to very few megafaunal extinctions, or they would have been blitzkrieg like Martin suggested. And of course that leads me to another problem area, which funnily enough is Australia. We've mentioned Australia as a notable area of megafaunal extinction. In fact, its proportion of extinction dwarfed that of the Americas, with 90% of their megafauna disappearing by modern day. I mean, what does the continent even have right now? The red kangaroo? Maybe, maybe the thylacine, if we really want to cope and assume it's still out there? But here's the problem. 
There's evidence indicating that humans first arrived on mainland Australia a little over 60,000 years ago. Many of the major Australian extinctions, on the other hand, occurred far later during that period. Diprotodon, the giant wombats of the Pleistocene, and the marsupial lion Thylacoleo went extinct 40,000 years ago, with the over 500-pound, short-faced kangaroo going extinct a little earlier 45,000 years ago. The enormous lizard Megalania died out shortly before this, around 50,000 years ago, and the same deal with the giant koala. Again, these are all exceptions to the rule, but we see that the biggest and most prominent of Australia's megafauna see their demise between the span of 50,000 to 40,000 years. What this means is that it took humans upward of 40,000 years to fully wipe out these animals, a far cry from the blitzkrieg Martin described. See, studies point to a different factor in the elimination of these animals. Around the same time as these extinctions, around 40 to 50,000 years ago, Australia went through a period of aridification. Drier climates could have very well played a part in the demise of many larger species unable to adapt to changing conditions. On the surface, it at least seems a little more plausible than a human-backed multi-species genocide. There were still some who tried to hold on to the idea that humans could be blamed for the extinctions. Some argue that since the Pleistocene often saw many different changes in climate, one eratification period wasn't nearly good enough an explanation on its own, and that humans could have easily have helped hunt down the animals. Others even argue that humans took advantage of the eratification, starting large and frequent fires in the dry grasses to mass wipe out the animals. In my personal opinion, it seems a little extreme and far-fetched. You know what? I'ma take it. <laughs> You heard it here first. Humans burned Australia to death. When will you guys learn that I don't actually use logic when I do these things? I don't care what I read. It's about the agenda. It's not about what you think. It's not about reading comprehension. It's not about the story. It's about agenda. At this point, I'm going to start listing off some more objections to Martin's theory and just some general alternative theories to the extinctions, many of which are very much valid. The first objection lies with the lack of human hunting sites or animal fossils with notable marks indicating damage from weapons like spears. If the humans went on a rampage during the Pleistocene, wildly killing all sorts of megafauna, why does the archaeological evidence not display this, instead showing far fewer actual human kill sites? Additionally, some researchers had issues when it came to the idea of animals being unable to quickly react to the onset of humans in their habitats. While it's documented that island species show high levels of naivete that led to their deaths at the hands of humans, continental species have historically been far more alert to danger, even relatively unknown ones. Some scientists didn't necessarily disagree with humans being the main cause for the extinctions, but believed their involvement was far less direct. They believed that humans could have carried diseases with them to different places that they migrated to, and that those diseases would have led to the deaths of the megafauna. And while this explanation helps account for the lack of kill sites and shows how extinctions could have occurred so quickly, there's still the issue of how just a few diseases could wipe out so many biologically distinct animals occupying a variety of different niches. There are still countless explanations and theories I could go over, but I think at this point you've gotten a decent grasp of the biggest ones at play. I joke about overkill being the most likely scenario for the megafinal deaths, but in truth even the most well-versed researchers are still stumped on the matter. It's strange, considering how much we know about large-scale extinctions far earlier in Earth's past, and yet an extinction starting only 50,000 years ago produces far more debate. I could sit here and tell you that humans were the big villains behind it all, that a bunch of stupid, worthless, dirty, disgusting, no-swag-having cavemen maliciously plotted a multi-continental killing spree, but that'd be a lie. And at the same time, I can't confidently tell you that climate change was the main factor in the extinctions either or that even a combination of the two theories could have been what killed off the megafauna. I feel bad droning about various theories without giving a definitive conclusion, but sometimes in paleontology and in science in general, we as humans just need to understand that we can't understand everything. It's easy to be upset at the loss of so much life in just the past few thousand years, but we should still appreciate all the animals we have around today. I for one feel blessed to live on the same planets as amazing creatures like elephants, giraffes, whales, and so on. At the same time, it's also important to understand that extinctions aren't just a thing of the past, and that today's species could very well become another statistic in the massive ongoing Holocene extinction. While it's dubious to think that humans could have killed off most of Earth's megafauna in the past, we absolutely have that power now, and the fact that animals such as rhinos, gorillas, tigers, and many others live on a knife's edge is proof of that. Reckless and cruel hunting, habitat loss, and other human-based activities are tearing this planet's life apart. And if we don't change our ways as a collective, we'll have a much larger extinction on our hands. 
one larger than any other in Earth's history, with a far more conclusive villain behind it. 